Hello and greetings to my YouTube subscribers. Thank you for subscribing. In this video, I'm going to teach you Schindler's List. I'll be teaching the fingerings that Itzhak Perlman uses in his Immortal Performance because I don't think you can think of Schindler's List, the theme to Schindler's List, without thinking of Itzhak Perlman. It was to him the violin solo was, was dedicated. So I'll be um, showing you more or less, you know, what he's doing with the left hand. In this video, I'll be teaching the first two phrases, the faster middle part and the end. I have on different videos that you can access and watch for free from my website, violinlab.com, and you can um, access that through the links below the player. So first, I'll play a phrase. You'll see the, the sheet music with, with, the, uh, the, with the fingerings that I've marked, and then I'll give you um, an up-close view of the left hand with, with an overview and tips and also tips on how to um, play it more expressively. So I hope you enjoy the video. So just a quick overview of some of the technical demands so that you can kind of start to structure your practice incorporating some of these techniques into warm-ups and exercises. One is that um, we have now an interval that you're going to be playing a lot and that is the interval of a fifth between first finger and, and your fourth finger. So we're going to be moving outside our usual one four hand frame, right, which is the span of the inter or the interval of a fourth. And so we're going to be reaching out of that because the melody is constructed around that interval. In the opening, it's not a problem because we can use um, the open D string. Okay, now you wouldn't do this. Okay, so if you are hoping to play this piece in first position, I have to tell you that um, you will be doing a lot of shifting. So when we have that same um, melody that in the second phrase, we're in a higher register, and it's it really doesn't make for smooth melodic playing to move the finger back and forth, you know, between two strings. You can see it's really it's really difficult for the left hand to make that work. So our kind of only option is the extension. You can successfully extend a, to a fifth, but it requires expansion of the whole hand, okay? So if you are pinching with your first finger like this, then you can't really expand the whole hand. Then it's left up to the pinky to reach that extension and, you know, most likely you won't hit the note, it'll be too low. Okay, so I have to make sure I'm not squeezing so that my whole hand can just expand. And I definitely want a loose thumb, okay, so that I can, it can be flexible. So when I have to reach, you know, it can change, it can pivot and rotate so that I can reach to that, to that pinky. And the same thing happens on the E string as well. Now, we can use the harmonic occasionally. We don't want to do it too many times in a row because then it loses its special effect. The shifting um, in, in this piece, there are lots of shifts, okay? There's a very wide tonal range. So we, um, we're having to shift to high positions, to low positions. If we just stay in, in, in like first position, then, then we lose so much of the expression. So there's a lot of shifting between first and second, or between 
third and second or fourth and third position. So small shifts. So I do have some exercises that you will find um, also uh, accessible with a link below on, on my website. Kind of help you um, start to warm up and incorporate some of these techniques into your into your exercise daily warm-ups. Um, also, generally with shifting, we like to glide on top of the strings. Okay, that's a classical shift. But in this piece, this is a very romantic style piece. We'll be shifting with our fingers holding the strings down in many cases, so you will so that you hear the shift. So it, it's a combination of a very loose thumb, but a finger that stays down, all right? So you'll be isolating, isolating here, keeping this loose while you, by holding, holding the string down, maintaining tension in the finger. All right, so we'll go, we'll go to the close up for the first phrase. So right away in this piece, we, we start with a shift to third position. And let me just say that many of the shifts um, you might think are unnecessary. But, but they're there for more for expressive purposes than for convenience purposes. So even though someone could play that in first position, you know, every violinist knows that his or her vibrato is much warmer and richer on any finger but, but the fourth finger. So, so not only do you shift to a finger that's easier, uh, for vibrato, but then you get the advantage of that, the little sound of the shift. So for whatever reason, when we hear these shifts, it just gives the piece um, more a, a more romantic quality. Now a classical shift, just to clarify, a classical shift, had this been a Mozart, um, these notes had been written by Mozart, I would have shifted on the first finger. And then once I got to third position, I would cross over the second finger. But because this is this is a very romantic style piece, I'm going to shift on my second finger so that you'll hear the end of that shift. Now there's a, a something I, I do differently with the bow too for for romantic style shifts. I change the bow before the new note or kind of right on the shift. Whereas in a classical shift, I would wait to change the bow until the arrival of the new note. Now romantic style. So that you get the little in there. Okay, so moving on. This next shift, again, it's, it's an expressive shift. And another one. So for expressive shifts, I'm basically shifting with my finger pressing the string down. I don't release, go to harmonic position, which is how we usually teach shifts. But we keep the finger, the first finger is going to start pressing down as it shifts. So that we can hear the shift. Now, at this point, um, Itzhak Perlman stays in third position. He plays four, and then three, three. I don't. I usually avoid fourth finger if I can. What I do is I just pivot up to fourth position during that open D so I can get that nice third finger vibrato on the C and then I pull my second finger back into third position. Now I want to point something out that's very important. It's the sequence of events with these kind of shifts. Most shifts, the hand and the thumb, they all move together. You know, you release and move. When I'm going from position to adjacent position, when I'm just sort of doing an expressive slide, 
I move my thumb first. So I'll do it in slow motion. This is the, this measure. So what I do is I disengage the thumb and then I just pull my, my hand. I just kind of pull it back to where the thumb is. It's like thumb goes first, all right, hand follows. So that's how I can do that with more accuracy. If I left my thumb in place, now my hand, my first finger, my thumb, they're not in frame. They're not in their, their, the position. So by moving the thumb first, now I pull my hand back to the new position and then it, it locks in. It locks into to third position in this case. Okay, and then moving on, now I'm in third position and I'm going to go across the string to second position because we have a fifth, but I need to put my second finger there so I can play the B flat. So I just pull the hand back right as I cross the string. One, pivot back, two, or shift back. Okay, if you do Itzhak Pullman fingering, then he just, pulls back to second position, and then he just moves his second finger straight over. But my, for me, it was smoother. I liked that better. Okay, now, reaching, you see that arrow on the third finger. It's like Perlman just, he just literally just, he just reaches his third finger back up to third position. Okay, I can't quite do it with just a reach. So mine's sort of a hybrid reach shift. I kind of still, I, I still sh pivot or shift with the first finger, but I reach at the same time. And now here comes another expressive shift. So third finger, pulling back to second position, thumb moving first. Now I just stay there. It's that Krohman adds yet another little expressive shift. And he really, he really um, exaggerates the, the connectedness of that, of that shift. Okay, and then gotta grab that A down in first position, no other way to play it. Okay, and then at this point, it's like Perlman's elbow, if you watch, he really brings it pretty far under because he's gonna grab that um, harmonic. Okay, and I shift back down, and so does he to second position. Now, that is not the easiest note to find. You know, shifting down to second, it just takes a lot of practice to feel secure with that. You could shift to first position, but then you're kind of stuck in, in first position after that. So, you know, just encourage you to work with your second position. Stay in second. Now you can stay there. And, and it's what Perlman does. I, you know, again, avoiding vibrato on fourth finger as much as I can. I go back to third by reaching and shifting. Okay, and here's a big slurpy shift from two to two. Now, I don't, in this case when I'm going up, I don't move my thumb. So the, the thumb moving first is mostly for descending. Here, I just push my hand up. And now my thumb joins. Now you'll hear this. Most performers, they add a shift. It's a, it's a faux shift, a fake shift. You're not really shifting to a note because you're going to open G. But if you just slide your hand back at the end of the F, it sounds like you're shifting. And then back to third position. you a 
little bit of musical coaching because I know you want to play this this really beautifully. The first thing is to find your sound, okay, and and to find a, a feel of your right arm right arm where it is really not not working at all. We want it to not have to extend a lot of effort because the left hand, you know, you're going to be doing a lot of shifting and the intonation is difficult. So so much focus on the left hand. You want the right arm to just be automatic and it can be in this piece fortunately. Okay, there's nothing tricky about the bowings. They're very predictable, um, very simple. But but finding that place, finding that no effort zone, okay, that's it's not difficult to find. It just takes a little bit of willpower. Most students get really in the habit of letting their bow ride too close to the fingerboard. And this actually is harder work. It's harder work to make a good sound close to the fingerboard. And you don't know exactly why it doesn't sound good. So the only way to do to make a nice sound close to the fingerboard is to speed the bow. But then you're not conserving bow. And in a slow piece like that, that'll never work. But up here, close to the bridge, is this really just a, a spot where the sound just is just automatic. You know, it just pours out with very little effort on your part. Right there. Okay, so I'm not doing anything. I'm just keeping the bow from falling down. So it's just the way to the bow and that magic spot where I get you know, a good million dollar tone there. Now I need my other fingers to change bow. All right, so find that spot. The next thing is to really wake up your inner artist, okay? So beautiful and, you know, tenderly it is marked, you know, it's the first indication of style. And so as you're playing this, you know, just play one measure over and over and over and, you know, ask yourself, ask your inner artist, you know, what notes you feel are the most tender and what, and, and what can you do about those? There are just two general things you can do to treat something um, special. And one is to add a little more pressure and another is to reduce pressure. And the contrast of that makes that note, you know, stand out. So... And, and this pickup, by the way, has a, a dash over it, which is to say it's not just a pickup. It's the first note, and it should be played warmly. So that first note to me that stood out as something special was the B flat. It's what kind of establishes the, the tonality, you know, the minor sound. So what I do is I just push in a little bit. I give a little bit more pressure. When I give more pressure, my bow yields to that by increasing bow speed a little bit. Okay, and then the next one. Same with this one. To me, it calls out for more pressure. But then the next one, that one, I lighten pressure, okay? You may not agree with that interpretation, and, and again, this is in large part based on, on a, it's a Perlman's interpretation, which I think is sort of universal. I think we feel these things very similarly. But um, I, I challenge you to, you know, explore, you know, your artistic feelings about it and play just cycle notes over and over. <laughs> Try something. It's like, well, what if you made those first notes kind of really rich and then backed off? Um, <laughs> which is sort of what I do. Or you can do the opposite. You know, either works, you know, as long as you have the conviction. So um, the other thing is that 
you we have these half notes that sort of connect these groups of eighth eighth notes. So these half notes, they cannot become static. You need to build a reserve of energy. <clears throat> and the way to do that is to slow your bow speed down at the beginning of, of, the, of the half note. Lay back. The beginning of that note does not have to be expressive. Non-expressive. Expressive. So I'm making it basically a general crescendo, and that serves to connect to the next phrase. And same to the with the next one. Unexpressive. Expressive. starting a new phrase. So basically we don't want to we don't want these longer phrases to be broken up into shorter segments. We really want the whole the feeling of one big long phrase after another. Now this second phrase is just the same as the first, just an octave higher. And when we have our, our motive here, okay, we never play the A's the same way in any one of those given motives. So in this case, in the first, the first A is on the E string, third position, crossing over, and then a reach to the, to the harmonic. Now here's, here's that um, beautiful, warm, expressive slide. And my second finger just kind of, you know, pushes my third finger out of the way. It kind of just usurps its position and then keeps moving up. Okay, I'm in fifth position now. And this time, for this next D, it's not really a shift back because that does sound a little silly and you wouldn't shift down the first with the first finger. So this one is just a reach back. So I'll do it in slow motion. So thumb, first finger, everything opens. It just, they just kind of pull apart. My, th my third finger has to stay in place, though. Another shift. Another pull back to second position. Now, I'm going to, same thing that I did earlier in the first phrase. My second finger is just going to cross, but at the same time, I shift back to first position. Now, these next few notes here, Isaac Perlman does some pretty unique fingerings here. He shifts to fourth position on the E. Then he does sort of a hand expansion where he reaches then the, the G. So he's reaching out, out of frame. So he's reaching to, to um, fifth position. And then he reaches to 
sixth position with the third finger. And that's a little scary for me in context with intonation. I do one, two, four. So Perlman does one, two, third, second finger, third finger, and then pulling back to the A. I go. Okay, and then it's that Perlman stays in fifth position now. And then he gives a fake shift here. So he's shifting down to the open A string, adding a little glissando. Okay, back to my way. And I shift back to first position here. Okay, so it's our Perlman way going on. Now he does something pretty unusual and, and I wouldn't do this because it's a little unorthodox for me. So first position and he slides, he gives a little, he wants an expressive shift here, but it's hard to go from say first position to third position. So he goes to second position and then he reaches with his fourth finger. So that's something I, I wouldn't do. And he reaches four, three, two, one. Okay, and what I do, I just make it simple for myself. But I still like the expressive quality, the A string. So I shift on that open A up to fourth position. And I had that nice warm third finger vibrato on the G there. And I stay in, uh, I'm sorry, yes, fourth position. And I pull back. Okay, now from this point, Itzhak Perlman stays in third. And he reaches. I do the same thing, except I go shift to get one more good romantic slurp in there. And then I reach back. Now, this, this harmonic reach, pulling back to third position. Okay, you don't have to move your, your thumb. Just as you're in first, uh, third position here, just extend. But when you extend, look, your, your fingers, your whole hand is sort of in this extended hand frame. Then when you release, just, you know, imagine it's like you're shrugging your shoulders and then you just drop your shoulders. It's, a, it's an act of relaxation to go So don't go. Just let it all collapse in. Your hand just collapses into its nice little soft, round cocoon of a hand. So now in this phrase, we have a louder dynamic marking, but it was just we just went from mezzo piano in the first phrase to mezzo forte. So don't don't worry too much about that. I mean, just, just the fact that you're playing it on higher strings is already gonna sound a little brighter and a little louder anyway. And, and dynamic markings from a soloist point of view is really for color. So we just sort of want to brighten the sound a little bit. And um, what, I, what I do or what I think of is that I'm just gonna tighten, tighten my sounding point just a little. So where um, I was, here I was um, in the opening. 
So I might be there, and then I'm just gonna bring it a little bit closer to the bridge. Not much, but a little bit. Not gonna work any harder. Just gonna tighten the sounding point a little bit, get a little closer to the bridge, and that'll take care of the dynamic. It'll brighten the sound. And um, I, when I was recording this, something I noticed in my own playing was it started to sound a little notey. You know, note, note. So I tried to just to think um, more connected from, from note to note, that it was just, you know, one very sort of breezy melody as if I were playing it all on one string, no string crossings, no shifts, no anything. So. But other than that, it's you know, basically the same interpretation, um, same style as, as the, the opening. Um, so th these first two phrases then complete the first section, and then we, we go to this middle section, which um, you'll have to access from Violin Lab and watch those videos there.